emotional freedom techniques. Um, it's a technique that works with the acupuncture meridians that acupuncturists use to put needles in. But rather than doing needles, you just tap on acupuncture points. And that also has the effect of releasing any stuck energy and helping us to um, unblock imbalances in our energy system. And it's wonderful for um, releasing um, strong and difficult emotions that some, sometimes get stuck in traumatic events in our life. And it also works um, in helping us to shift our perception, change uh, perhaps um, non-serving beliefs, negative beliefs. Um, and um, that falls into uh, a little bit about why I wrote the book. And uh, working with um, EFT clients, I have found that um, the process of shifting um, perception is really um, what helps us to bring about healing um, uh, of past um, difficult events. And um, I wanted to be able to present some of this material in a non-technical way, in a way that um, uh, everybody could understand it. It's uh, they're old ideas, but now we are learning how to apply them in new ways, and EFT is one of these ways. Perception and distortion. There's one more very important point to note in how our perception makes errors. You may find it a little unsettling, but it needs addressing because it can cause deep distortion in how we see ourselves. Take a look at this example. My husband and I were watching Toy Story 3. Towards the end of the movie, something did not make sense to me because I could clearly recall that the young man put his cowboy toy named Woody in the box that was labeled Attic. I mentioned this to my husband, and he said, no, he put it in the box labeled college. Because I could run that part of the movie in my mind and see Woody going into the attic box, I believed I was right. I was so sure that what I saw in my mind was correct that I insisted we rewind the movie. <laughs> So, let me watch that part again. Wow. I found it really difficult to believe what my eyes were showing me. Woody did go into the box called labeled college. I was dumbfounded. How could I have been so sure and been completely wrong? For me, it was curious to observe that I chose to believe what I thought and could see in my mind Woody going into the addict's box and would not believe my eyes when they were seeing the truth. Woody going into the college box. It seems silly how I placed more faith in what my perceiving mind was showing me rather than in the information coming from my physical senses and my husband. <laughs> but, my husband was not so amused, and with good reason, I might add. To understand what happened in my Toy Story 3 example, let's explore further our informational database and what happens when new information is coming in. Like I said before, as we grow and learn, we correct and let go of some of the information in our memory database. We stop believing in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, for example. Information is revised, updated, and released. Information that survives this continual process of revision and updating gets reinforced with time and experience. The long-standing, stronger beliefs left intact in the process of learning become foundational cornerstones 
to our identity and world perspective. They provide perceptual stability to our self and our life, even if they are incorrect, much like the belief that the world was flat that endured for centuries. While we can still shift our perspective and revise our foundational beliefs, it becomes harder because they have been getting reinforced over and over in time, becoming more deeply imprinted into our perception. Perceptual stability is assured through a subconscious filtering mechanism made up of our foundational beliefs. Most all new information must pass through these perceptual filters. Information from new experiences will get evaluated by our foundational beliefs before it is accepted into our database for storage. If the new information matches the existing foundational belief, it is allowed in. But if it does not, it may be ignored, dismissed, or distorted to force a match. Distortion will happen if the new information puts into question and challenges an existing subconscious foundational belief that we have taken on as part of our identity. This is called identification, and I will describe it in detail in another chapter. Keeping the foundational belief from being revised becomes a priority for our perceiving mind because it is seen as a part of us. Whatever threatens to do away with the belief is felt to be a personal threat to who we are. In these situations, fabricating a revised version of reality becomes justified and necessary in our mind, as in the case of my Toy Story 3 example. It is important to recognize the power the perceiving mind has to distort truth when it imagines and presents a different picture of reality, reality to us, and we believe it. When we subconsciously choose to believe our imagination over the facts, we lose touch with reality. This blinds us to the whole truth of what is present before us. It is quite astonishing to witness the length our perceiving mind is willing to go to to hold on to some of its cherished beliefs. It is like going to look for the mayonnaise jar in the refrigerator, and because it is not where we believe it should be, we pick up the jar of pickles that's in its place and ima imagine it to be the mayonnaise. We do this in order to keep our beliefs intact and not see that our thinking is incorrect. Clearly, the pickles are still the pickles, but in our mind, we can make believe they are the mayonnaise. Accepting new facts that revise and validate what we believe to be true is the basis for learning and the mechanism that updates the content of our database. When this takes place, our perception is also revised and we see things differently. If this does not happen, we miss an opportunity for possible growth. I've been so amazed that all the authors here have kept to their five minutes. Oh. If then I don't have to look like a meanie. <laughs> Elspeth oh. 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 Sorry. Don't worry, I'll get to you. Here, Elspeth has a question. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, could you really, what you just read through it, which is fascinating, um, to self-esteem and the yeah, self-esteem? Mm -hmm. So I, <clears throat> what I needed to do was ex really explain how our perception works, because we need to understand how our ideas about ourselves get made up and get uh, believed, and um, why, why it is so difficult for us to um, accept that we are perfect <laughs> in a divine way. Okay, and so the, the foundation for um, consistent and non-changing self-esteem 
is, is really connecting to something that goes beyond um, what we can identify with in terms of um, our achievements or um, our work or um, anything that um, uh, we can accomplish or that um, that's, that, that comes and goes because it's not eternal. So the perspective is spiritual, fundamentally, and I'm trying to help, um, help us go to that place where um, what we are is um, recognized as um, completely uh, perfect. I've got a question. I can't think of a better example of what you just talked about than what we're going through right now with the presidential election and people's inability to deal with facts against their perceived notions and ideas. But against that backdrop, how do we as an individual or even as groups modify that behavior and try to become more fact-based, if you will, for lack of a better term. Right. So um, the other the other point that I make in the book is that the way that perception works is that it shows us basically what we believe. So if we do want to see a world. Uh, where there is more cooperation, where people really can agree um, on what is uh, best overall, uh, then, then that's what we need to want to believe uh, is possible, and that's what we need to make sure that, that uh, we uh, become responsible for what we see, because the beliefs and the perception go together. So, so in that situation, I want to make sure that I believe that people are fundamentally uh, good intention and that uh, it is completely possible to cooperate and communicate despite what uh, uh, it appears, despite appearances. So, so uh, and because fundamentally, at the spiritual level, um, uh, we all share in the same life. We, from that point of view, uh, we all have one mind. And, and the power of our mind is so amazing uh, because uh, once we conceive of something, um, it is not unusual that um, someone across the other world will have the same same thought. So we're, we're all linked together, and we can't underestimate the power of changing our own self within and what effect that has on the world. Does that help? Yeah, that's very true. Another question? Amanda? It's, it's late. It's, it's wonderful that you said want, because I was wondering, it, that's a revelation to me, that um, that we, that our beliefs, that we think that's us, that we believe that our beliefs are us, okay? So to shift those, I, it sounds as if we have to want to shift them. That ties a little bit to your question, how do we help people want to move the filter? Right. Right. Well, we want to show them what their filters are doing in their life. And if they don't like what is showing up in their life, then it's time to change. And so, um, all we need to really do is show them that there is a better way, and um, we have that choice. We do. We do. We have to want to, to do it. But if what is working now is not really working, then then clearly we need change. Uh, one last question, David. Uh, the practice you do, would it have any crossover to early stages of Alzheimer's? Um, it, it's applicable to um, basically everything because um, 
and interestingly enough, I, I, my own mother had his, um, has Alzheimer's. She's in the late stages. And I, by the time I learned EFT, she was already in the middle stages and she wasn't able to um, be able to communicate well enough for me to do it. But I, I did apply it. I worked surrogately, which means that um, doing muscle testing, um, I was able to try to help her uh, with um, some of her fears. For example, she'd be afraid to go to bed at night to relieve some of the fear, some of the anxieties that would show up for her. Um, but she couldn't really communicate and tell me what, what was going on. And, um, so with the EFT, you want to target what you are trying to release and let go of. But um, in the case of small children or people that are, you know, um, can't communicate very well, then I use the muscle testing, which is um, from kinesiology. I don't know if you're familiar with that. but. Um, so yeah, it's, applic it's applicable to Alzheimer's, it's applicable to, um, to, to anything because if you believe in the mind-body connection, uh, what we are doing is we're working with um, the emotions that anchor the beliefs. And it is the mind that is giving the instructions to the body. Um, that's basically the, the foundation.